He can I your key? So I handed over the key to him. I was thinking, now what is he going to do? So he opened the door for me. He, he made me sit down. I rolled down the glass. When this tray goes outside, what do my peons and the staff do? They pack up these pastries in their small lunch boxes and take them home to their children. And uh, he found GRD with so much toilet paper in his hand, bent and cleaning the commode. Impossible is not a fact. It is an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It is a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. episode of Tata Gatha season 3 wherein we are in conversation with Mr Don Dungabu ji reviewing his lovely book Living by Values so welcome to yet another episode of Tata Gatha thank you very much girish nice to be here again thank you sir and uh, in this episode sir i would like you to speak to us about the legendary tata leaders that you have worked with namely mr jari tata mr suman mulgaonkar mr rashi modi mr nani palkewala and of whom you have written about in this beautiful book. So let us begin with uh, your interactions with Mr. J.R.D. Tata. You have spoken about uh, your tenure with him in the past, I think in the first episode of this season. Uh, it will be helpful to have you recount those days yet again for us. Thank you very much, Girish. Uh, I've said a little bit about J.R.D. Tata. It's almost impossible to sum up in any amount of time and any number of volumes the personality that he was. Uh, but maybe just one other dimension which I've covered in my book is was his obsession with perfection uh, and his love for uh, flying and, and Air India, which he created. Uh, I'll begin with a small episode or incident about how he was bothered about uh, everything being in the right place and he, everything had to be just perfectly done as far as possible. In fact, there is a popular quote by him. He says, one must forever strive for excellence or even perfection in any task, however small, and never be satisfied with the second best. So, chalta, ho, chalta hai was never his attitude. Uh, I was fond of cars and I am still fond of cars. I couldn't uh, afford the kind of cars that... Uh, Ratan Tata, for example, his hobby is also the same, but uh, I couldn't afford those vehicles. So I used to go to Delhi, purchase a second-hand car if discarded by one of the embassies and use them. I got a Toyota once like that from Delhi uh, because embassies used to auction their vehicles at that time. Uh, for some, uh, JRD knew that I dabbled in cars as such. And so one day, I don't know for what reason, he wanted to buy a second-hand car, maybe for somebody. So with great uh, with great effort, I located a car which I thought was worth showing to JR Dita. It was the Fiat 124, which is later became Fiat 118 NE, for those who will remember that week. So I had it brought to Bombay House, and I said, sir, the car is here, would you like to see it? He said, yes, let's go. So both of us... Uh, Got, uh, went down. I He said, you drive. So I told the driver that we'll take a round and come back. Uh, so that was the longest drive I had with Mr. Jihadi Tata. So we uh, drove for almost 10-15 kilometers. Uh, if you know Bombay from Flora Fountain to Hanging Gardens and all kinds of places, crowded, not crowded. And I parked the car when we came. So he said, uh, he said, uh, as we, we, I handed over the uh, keys to the driver, and as we were going up in the lift, he said, Don, you're a good driver. Any appreciation from J.I.D. Tata meant that my weight would increase by five kilos instantly. But uh, jokes apart, I said, sir, thank you very much. But what, what made you say that? He said, I was observing. Like all the drivers that I drive with in Bombay, you are the only one who did not leave your, did not leave your left foot on, uh, on the clutch pedal, even when it was not necessary. So he said, you never press the clutch and you did not keep your foot 
on the clutch pedal when it was not necessary. Where in Bombay, in manual driving, you have no choice but to brake and go for brake and drive, brake and drive. So he said, uh, so sitting there, he was observing where my left foot was, whether it was on the clutch pedal or not. It was, you know, that kind of perfection. I said, thank God I didn't make the mistake of resting my left foot on the clutch pedal. So nothing would escape his eye. Uh, a line from uh, Michelangelo says, one must forever strive. No, that was J.R.D.'s quote. Sorry, he says, uh, trifles are important because it, uh, are essential because trif without paying attention to trifles, you cannot create perfection. So for, to be perfect, trifles are important. I'm paraphrasing uh, Michelangelo's uh, quote, actually. And uh, J.R.D. was a man like that. Uh, so when it came to Air India, which was his passion, he would go and inspect a, uh, uh, an aircraft which has landed or which was about to take off and check everything personally. It was always unannounced. There were no aero bridges. So you climbed 40 steps to get into a Boeing 747, 300 plus seats. You know, we Indians have the habit of chewing pan and spitting everywhere. The foreigner, when he doesn't know where to throw the chewing gum, he sticks it under the chair. Now, J.R.D. Tata would inspect 300 chairs, every row almost. And if he found a chewing gum stuck to any of the chairs, he would remove it with his bare hands. Uh, he would move the curtains. He would uh, use his, uh, move his palm uh, where you keep your handbags just to see if there was any dust there. Who's bothered about dust there? So in his time, uh, Air India, from a third world country as we were at that time, was one of the top three airlines of the world. And Singapore Airlines, when they started their airlines, they benchmarked their services with Air India only because of GRD's obsession with perfection. So a friend of mine who was a purser in the aircraft, he once mentioned to me, he's now 95 years old and a dear friend, he lives in Pune, uh, Kushro Tarapur is his name. So he said one day GRD was doing the rounds in the aircraft and uh, Suddenly, we found JRD was missing. So we looked for him under the chair, above the chair, behind curtains, until he, that is Kushru, found a light filtering out of the uh, toilet cabin. So he wondered whether JRD was there. Uh, so he opened the door slowly, and uh, he found JRD with so much toilet paper in his hand, bent, and cleaning the commode. So he said, sir, what are you doing? He says, can you not see? Some of our Indian passengers do not know how to use Western facilities. So I'm cleaning the commode. So, so Kushu said, sir, do, you don't do it. Please give it to me. He said, why can I not do it? Is this not my airline? That was the commitment JRD had towards Air India. But most, most importantly, you know, we believe uh, in our Hindu philosophy that when the Atman merges with the Brahman, it is Nirvan. Girish, this is professional Nirvan. When you and your company become one and the same thing. So th that is, these are one or two other incidents that I thought I'll share with you. Amazing, sir. <clears throat> Amazing. Very difficult to believe uh, on this kind of uh, humility as well as uh, obsession with perfection. And uh, to do this with so much of warmth, elegance, grace, and to take everyone along uh, with one and then to create such a large legacy and a huge business empire. Uh, frankly, there are no words for it. Yeah, I, know. Uh, I would now like you to uh, recount your experiences <clears throat> while working with uh, Mr. Rusi Modi. Whatever little I have read of him has been uh, as a young teenager growing up in Kashmir. Uh, when I read, uh, when I used to read of him in uh, Business India and Business World, of his ability to mix around with all kinds of people, of his uh, ability to influence decision making within the Indian industry, and how as a professional manager he became a giant amongst men within the Tata group. And uh, therefore, sir, over to you to speak on Mr. Rasi Modi. In a way, he was, a, he was the senior I loved the most. Uh, I respected everybody else. I was in awe of everybody else. But because of the fact that he drew you closer to himself, and I was very fortunate to be one of them. Uh, and I have, in fact, in, on his birth centenary, written a piece about only his sense of humor, where I've narrated many incidents in that piece. And maybe I'll send it to you one of these days. But Mr. Modi was a person who in, 
inspired performance. He did not have to command performance. And uh, because of his uh, love for people and because the people loved him so much. So for him, it was extremely important to, uh, to sort of be the guiding light in terms of human uh, relations. Uh, somebody said, sir, you're a great man manager. So he says, I don't understand that phrase. Because if management is not managing people, what is it? So people were always his priority. And in fact, in my book, I have said the same thing. My concluding chapter is only people matter. Uh, now, in, in, so narrating incidents, uh, maybe we have to spend the whole day if I had to only speak about Rusi Bodhi. But two things uh, stand out. One of them I have narrated in my book, which is uh, he taught me that nothing is impossible. That is, uh, was one of the things. And of course, the second was, you could reduce uh, any stress, tension in a heated argument happening or discussions happening in, in, or, uh, in the company or with other people outside by just suddenly, uh, uh, by suddenly just cracking a joke or saying something so irrelevant uh, that everybody, you know, their minds are distracted and then they can focus in a more constructive way. One of the incidents I narrated there. But let me just uh, talk by, about nothing is impossible. Uh, I, I was almost a nobody at that time. And Mr. Modi, in his house, and to which I had been many, many times, had a piano stool. You know, he played the piano. In fact, he played the piano with Einstein playing on the violin. <laughs> so he was at that time, he was uh, not a trained pianist, but he played it by the ear and he played it very well. So I was, uh, he told me that, you know, today I'm having some guests at seven o'clock in the evening. I want you to change the tapestry of the stool seat to be exactly like the one with the rest of the furniture, the sofa set that year. Now I have been so many times, I knew that tapestry of a sofa set must have been at least seven, eight years old, if not older. So I said, how can you do that, sir? Where will I find that tapestry? Even if I find it in the next five hours, how do you expect me to do this? Who will do it? Such a small job. Nobody will want to do it. No carpenters, no, ta no tailors. And where do I do it? So he said, that's your problem. It's, it's, you have to do it. I kept on uh, appealing, arguing, this is not possible. I said, so, so the whole story is narrated in the book. And what happened to me after he said, I don't know, you just have the school ready at 7 o'clock. Believe me, my situation was nothing better than the tramp in a Charlie Chaplin movie. I went all over the city of Bombay. Luckily for me, in some, uh, some isolated place, somewhere in a mar crowded market, I could find one meter of cloth exactly matching that tapestry. And then what I did, how I found the tailor, how I found the machine, the sewing machine, everything is narrated in the book. But by six o'clock, the stool was ready. So I, for the first time, Ganga was his butler at that time. I was in his house. I said, Ganga, that was the first time I had any water in the six hours that I was running about. Now the anticlimax, if I may say so, was next morning, Obviously, the party must have gone off well. But next morning, very proudly, I went to his room. I said, sir, did you like the stool? I did it exactly in time the way you wanted. He said, what stool? That shocked me. I said, what are you saying? I almost wanted to bang the table and say, what are you saying? I worked so hard. He said, oh, that stool. As if he had... I said, yeah, yeah, that stool. What happened? Did you like it? He said, look, I could have done without that tapestry. I said, what is he saying? Then why did he bother me so much if he could have done without that tapestry? He said, I only insisted on you doing it because I wanted to show you that nothing is impossible if you want it badly enough. And those lines I never forgot because I always told my teams, I just had to light the spark of wanting it badly enough. And that is the time we were able to successfully turn around companies. So the impossible was taught, is nothing is what was taught to me by Lucy Modi. Uh, there is a lovely quote I remember of an Adidas ad years ago. It says, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world they have been given 
then they then to explore the power they have to change it impossible is not a fact it is an opinion impossible is not a declaration it is a dare impossible is potential impossible is temporary impossible is nothing that message i learned from Mr. fantastic Mr. sir fantastic so i've seen the tagline impossible is nothing but i have never heard the the previous stanzas behind before it concludes that impossible is nothing thank you so much for sharing that another luminary that you worked with sir during your years with the tatas was mr nani palkiwala a personal yeah. favorite of mine yeah. uh, during growing up years one read and saw photographs splashed all over all over indian express times of india of his famous uh, lectures and talks after the finance minister would give his budget speech wherein he would not even hesitate a minute to shred it down to pieces right. uh, with his views and his take on the subject and uh, mr nani palkiwala uh, if i'm not mistaken also uh, came out with an annual book on uh, taxation at that point of time uh, and i have read a little bit more about him uh, in mr harish bhat's book right. uh, wherein he counted a few stories of mr palkiwala i also happened to read this book by mr palkiwala called we the people uh during i think after i graduated uh, from my mba institute uh, it will be helpful sir if you could uh, narrate your tenure with him and your association with him and also touch upon the aspects of uh, what a brilliant legal man and what a brilliant tax mind he had uh as i said earlier i didn't directly work for mr palkiwala although i had the opportunity to do so so i was like you one of his millions of admirers that he had and his budget speech which started in a small hotel called the greens next to the taj the greens was owned by the taj uh, at that time there was no tower there where the tower is today the greens used to be there and uh, which which started there ultimately reached the bebon stadium because people thronged to his uh, budget speech and there were uh, Hundred thousand people attending his budget speech. People would from the suburbs leave after lunch so that they could get a seat. So you can imagine what that budget speech was, and it was uh, popularly said in those days that India has two budget speeches: one by the finance minister and the second by Mr. Nani Palkiwala. And he never held a scrap of paper in his hand when he spoke on the budget. He was he had a phenomenal manner, very humble beginnings, uh, but uh, he grew to be a giant among men in 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 those times and as i said earlier uh, rajgopala chari called him god's gift to india so i didn't have direct uh, shall i say uh, working experience with him but because of being a part of jrd's office occasionally i did meet him but my first meeting with him was uh, very interesting and that showed taught me empathy i mean i've always loved people so i could immediately relate to what he was saying and uh, uh, when i met him i went into his room uh, he, he had given me some time and he ordered it was just him and me and he ordered three taj trays now the taj tray for directors uh, which we lesser mortals occasionally got it uh, you know was was something we all sort of look forward to if we could be in a place like that uh, a taj tray had silver kettle silver jug for the milk silver container for the sugar fantastic uh, crockery a starched uh, white cloth on the tray and the tray itself was i don't know how expensive and most importantly it came with two pastries from the lapathesari of the taj which in those days must be costing maybe 70 80 rupees today one pastry cost 400 rupees but uh, that pastry one chocolate and one something else would come with the tray now he ordered three trays although it was just two of us so when the when the trays came i was wondering why the third tray has been there but i didn't ask him any question uh, but he was only sipping tea and standing uh, sitting before him i didn't have to have the courage to dip into the dip into the chocolate uh, or love, uh, the truffle pastry which was in the in my tray simply because the boss was not doing it it would look very impolite so i also just left it as it was in spite of the saliva ballooning in my mouth i i, I couldn't uh, i couldn't do anything i waited uh, 
then I couldn't resist it. So I said, sir, are you expecting someone else to join us at our meeting? He said, that's the time he explained. He said, uh, Dungaji, I must tell you that even if I'm alone, I always ordered two cups, uh, two trays. Today, because it was you, I ordered three, one for me, one for you, and one just extra. Then he explained. He said, think about it. When I don't eat the cakes, when this tray goes outside, what do my peons and the staff do? The lower level people. They pack up these pastries in their small lunch boxes and take them home to their children. Can you, can you ever imagine a peon working in my office or any office in Bombay House ever be able to afford a La Patisseri pastry? That was the level of empathy that he had for his people or for people as such. I said, my God, this is this is a learning that I can never forget. So that was his empathy part. Uh, and totally unbelievable, sir, in today's age and times. Absolutely. I, I will be very honest with you. I tried to implement what I learned that day, but 10-15% of the time I wasn't successful. I, it was irresistible, <laughs> the cake on my table. But most of the time I could uh, succeed in doing it because he taught me that. And so you also worked with Mr. Ratan Tata as a contemporary wherein you sat next to him and worked alongside him. And he was, I think, five, six years your senior. Yes. Mr. Tata, of course, uh, grew on to become the chairman of Tata Sons and was uh, responsible to a very large extent on the transformation of the Tata Group from uh, a largely Indian company to a, a robust multinational group with multiple acquisitions. Uh, if you could share with us a few instances of uh, working alongside him during those early days at Bombay House. Thank you. In Bombay House, uh, when I joined, uh, Mr. Ratan Tata was uh, uh, a trainee in Jamshedpur. I think these great people, uh, including up to Mr. Ratan Tata, became who they were, not only because they were Tatas, but the environment in which they sort of grew and learned uh, what had to be learned to be in Jamshedpur. Uh, J.R.D. Tata, Ratan Tata, Rusi Modi, they were all people in Jamshedpur who started at the lowest rank so that they could understand people, not just the business, so that they could understand people. But when I joined, I was there for about a year or two, and Ratan Tata, after finishing his training in Tata Steel and Tata Motors, at that time Telco, joined Bombay House. And the simple and easygoing person that he was, we sat in an open hall. There was no room for him, no cubicle, nothing. So it was Ratan Tata on one side, uh, Arun Myra, who has endorsed my book uh, on, on second, and me as the third, in the same row, with our tables touching. Godrej table, Godrej simple chair with a khaki cushion on it, nothing more. He never demanded that I was a Tata, so I must get another, another, another place or another cabin or cubicle. Uh, that was his. Uh, he has been like that, low profile always. So, I did not have the, shall I say, good fortune of working directly with him as, uh, as a, as a part of his office, as it were. But as an observer from outside, uh, I have. I have been a part of that journey uh, from, from that time. And Ratan later became India's repre uh, Tata representative in Australia. So after one year in, in, in Bombay House, he moved on to, to Australia, came back. Uh, of course, the director Tata Industries, later Tata Sons, and finally the chair uh, chairman of the group, uh, who took it to a totally different level, as you said. Uh, the point is, that Milind Rege, who is a cricketer friend of mine, when we were growing so much, he said, uh, and Mr. Ratan Tata was, you know, acquiring, I think, more than 60 companies, big and small. He uh, asked me this very important question. He says, Don, we are likely to grow so much exponentially as Mr. Ratan Tata is doing, having got the freedom to grow. Uh, what do you think? We may become a successful company, but will we remain a great company? This is a very interesting question. I pondered about it. But while Ratan Tata was there, I said, so long as Mr. Ratan Tata is there, we will be successful and great. But at the same time, it taught me that, you know, 
success can be a part of greatness greatness need not be a part of success and uh, and in tatars in rotten tatars time and perhaps the all the times that i have been a part of the golden era of the group as such success and greatness have been two wheels of the same chariot driving the tata machine as it were uh, yes i interacted with him he was uh, very kind to me very supportive and i have written one instance there where i was very frustrated about something not happening i have explained what it was and one day he he came to know about it invited me to his place and just he and me one on one having been together for so many years i could pour out my heart before him uh, he listened to what my complaint was and he sort of nodded and said is that so and he didn't promise solutions he just heard me that itself relieved me of uh, of of so much of anxiety that i was facing up to that moment and then as i stood up to leave he said he came up to the door i thought he was being extra courteous which he's always been courteous like dear editor to everybody is all a big and i in i shook his hand i said thank you for your time and he said no no let me see you up to the lift i said you don't have to see me up to the lift he said no no let me see you up to the lift so he came up to the lift in those days you know not automatic doors you had those collapsible uh, doors so when the lift came up no lift man he opened the door for me you know the, he was constantly concerned about what my feelings were at that time so when i started getting into the lift he said no let me see you up to the lobby he said you don't have to see me up to the lobby it was getting embarrassing for me but he was so concerned about uh, how agonized i was feeling so we come up to the lobby again he opens the door we get fourth check and i said thank you mr uh, thank you ratan i said i'll i'll take your leave he said no no let me see you up to the car i said that was a bit too much i thought he, now i was praying i hope he's not driving me home i mean he could go to any extent to make another person feel comfortable so when i reached the car which was a which was the only time i used a, a premier padmini in which everything but the horn made a lot of noise so you know what kind of car it was so he said can i have your keys can i have your keys so i handed over the key to him i was thinking now what is he going to do so he opened the door for me he, he made me sit down i rolled down the glass and he handed over the key to me and as i was driving away for almost 50 meters the road was very clear i could see mr ratan tata not having turned back and gone to he just looking at my stupid car thinking is this guy I and mean, that's my interpretation thinking that this guy is he sort of calm enough is he going to drive rashly he was just looking at it so as i drove towards my place which was about 4 kilometers from there i said to myself that if this was the healing process in my group then i was ready for a thousand wounds and after that whenever i felt pain it was this incident and one with jyani tat that my restored my morale in maybe Five minutes. Uh, I never felt uh, let down after that. Uh, so that healing was exceptional. Uh, so I would not give up. I mean, uh, give up this one experience with Ratan Tata for all the money in the world. It is too precious, too priceless for me. Very true. And those golden words of yours, sir. If this was the healing, I'll be ready for a thousand wounds. It speaks volumes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing this incident. 